Next speaker teaches at Harvard University, uh, where she's the uh, executive director of the project on Europe and the transatlantic relationship, which is the topic she's done work on for many years. Um, in uh, 2017, for example, she examined how urban networks are changing international relationships, which is also something that will influence her talk today, which is titled, How Cities and State Diplomacy Are Changing the Alliance, a Neo-Hanseatic Perspective. Please join me and welcome Catherine Kluther Ashbrook. Thank you. Thank you. A time of great change. The world hovering on the cusp of a new era. Old powers, alliances unclear. Western armies in the Middle East, and Turks in Syria. New power rising from the Far East, lapping at the shores of Europe. Trade under threat, new technologies changing everything. And no, of course, it's not the 21st century I'm talking about, not our time of transatlantic dismay, NATO pullback, potentially, trade war, Facebook, Google, and the Xi Jinping's, and Xi Jinping's China. But the century almost a thousand years ago that saw the rise of the Hanseatic League. It was a time of the Crusades, Genghis Khan, the Magna Carta, and the Holy Roman Empire, and a network of cities across northern Europe pulled their continent, their region, from darkness into light, from the Middle Ages into the Renaissance. Then nearly 200, years, 200 cities of the Hanseatic League in its heyday, they banded together for trade and for security. They had their own police force, they had their own tax policy, they became rich, and they became powerful. They outshone kingdoms and empires. The cities of the Hanseatic League created a network that was adaptive and it was resilient across wide swaths of territory. They created knowledge among each other. They shared information, what today we call data, the gold of our era, to make each other more resilient because their power, their wealth, and their prospering was interdependent. These cities as a network had the power, and they used it well. Could that work again for a wider region, for the wide span of the transatlantic rela relationship? We're at a precarious moment. Nationalists are trying to back away from the multilateral order, from an interconnected world. Cities will not, and they cannot. They know their health and their wealth depend on this interconnectedness, and that means interdependence. To protect themselves and their citizens, they have become self-interested actors in the international world, just like their forebears in the Hansa. The 21st century nations of the transatlantic alliance, they need to recognize and work with this new network power. The numbers prove that cities aren't just composites of the world. No, they are becoming the world. By 2050, and you know these numbers, cities will hold 68% of the global population. They already drive 80% of global GDP. And a huge number of the world's richest, most resilient cities are right here in the transatlantic sphere. Paris has a bigger economy than South Africa. New York City, the city that I served a decade ago, has a bigger GDP than Australia. And Paris's economy, Paris's economy, is bigger than all of Saudi Arabia's. Their power lights up the sky at night. Airways, seaways, they secured the wealth of European and American cities for decades. Now, globalization and connectivity that comes with the fiber optic cables and data and money that travels across them makes cities more globally intertwined than ever before. It makes city halls smarter and faster and more aware and more responsive and more globally empowered. They are more ready and able to carve out their own paths in some ways, in opposition to their national governments. In their density, their wealth and their interconnectedness, cities feel policy, and cha policy changes first. They're on the front lines for terrorism, for cyber attacks, for infectious disease, and for climate calamity and economic disruption. And they're no, will no longer willing to be passive bystanders to these phenomena. Cities now have options. 
They can invest in deepening economic and security ties with an established system like the Transatlantic Alliance, or they can look to Asia. They can glide beyond it, looking for the dynamic, dynamic and moving, fast-moving cities in Asia or the creative cities in Latin America. I say, let's enlist them in the cause of the transatlantic relationship. And with that, let's find the transatlantic renaissance. Cities are now mounting independent trade delegations, and they're engaging in bilateral, multilateral, and diplomatic avenues of all kinds. Their businesses are deeply linked. Their scientists and researchers are connected. Their police departments every day are more integrated to help scan the globally secured landscape for threats. So while nations jostle and bicker, cities every day are building trust and they're building value. Let's look how that's working. Boston's airport was once the model for Singapore. Now Boston turns to Rotterdam to figure out how to keep its airport and its city's innovation district right on the water. That's low lying, safe from rising seawaters. Singapore, in turn, shares how they elevated their airport. These connections are direct. They don't flow through Washington or the Hague. Boston calls Rotterdam on the phone. In a global context, this one call to City Hall takes on an entirely new meaning. They talk on commerce and security, public health, social equality, urban engineering, and on and on. Sister city relationships are no longer for drinking tea and exchanging school classes. No, they're for making contracts on issues that work. Universities like Harvard, where I teach and research, support this deepening integration by training mayors from all over the world on effective, tested responses to public policy challenges. The University of Southern California in Los Angeles actually does diplomatic training for mayors. And whether it's Hamburg or Los Angeles or New York, guess what they all have? They have their own foreign ministries. This is urban diplomacy. It's bilateral. It's multilateral. It's platform-based, and it's networked. And national capitals and nation-state networks—they're beginning to listen. The EU, the UN—they're beginning to grasp cities, powers, and networks. For Atlanticists like all of us in the room, watching the fraying region, the fraying ties of nation-states across this region, this can mean only one thing: it's time to sit up and listen to cities. To recognize the value that they're bringing to upholding our values and to keeping our countries physically safe and economically viable, we have to understand that there is a thriving tier right below the national level of multilateral ties of these networked cities, and we need to engage them at a more granular level. Over time, it's true they could conflict with some of our tribal impulses, the tribal impulses that we hold as nation states. But you know what? That could be good for the alliance, right? Like allies, they could expose our blind spots. City alliances are more fluid than our classic, traditional defense alliances, and they're adaptive above all. This could be an advantage for all of us. Let's look at quickly four critical, relevant areas in which cities are exercising this new power as part of these networks through their metro diplomacy. On climate change, these women and men are but A selection of the 90 mayors that have come together as part of C40, 650 million inhabitants. That's almost twice the population of the United States under this C40 umbrella. They have built a city network organized to combat climate change that's based on data and metrics, and they have muscled themselves into the national conversations. They have forced. The nations to sit up and listen, and they have taken a seat. These mayors have been present at every UN COP negotiation since the Paris Agreement, and they've inspired others. 287 mayors in the United States, as you know, have taken America's pledge. Important to say, on the day after the Trump administration announced that it was formally proceeding to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. On economic diplomacy, cities are open for business. Not just London. They are dispatching their own trade delegations without cabling back to their embassies and consulates. 4,000 special economic zones that are linked to cities are reshaping global supply chains. U.S. cities like Boston, my hometown, now sponsors H-1B visas for entrepreneurs when the national government closes its doors. In the U.S. and Italy, they have local citizenship accords to protect their workers 
when they need to keep them within city walls. And we know that 536 American cities are now officially sanctuary cities. They work together to protect their workforce against what they see is national overreach. And cities push back when national decisions don't quite add up and deliver for them. Forty mayors signed a, signed a declaration against TTIP. Well, we all know how that ended. TTIP went down. On counterterrorism, do you know the New York Police Department helped arrest the Paris bombers from the Bataclan bombing in 2015? The city of New York has intelligence officers that are deployed across the world to safeguard its own security. By being present in Madrid and Paris and Lyon, France, and then by working with authorities at all levels, the NYPD has helped host a host of other European cities anticipate and prepare for the worst. London has a similar model. They're collecting data and they're arming themselves against some of the worst threats we might imagine. Ask yourself, if we had more urban wiring into our national intelligence services, would we have had the Christmas market bombing right here in Berlin? Or the Boston bombing? Lone wolf terrorism, fighting ransomware and massive cyber attacks on critical infrastructure, all are now mainstreamed into urban bureaucracies from Barcelona to Baltimore. And civic engagement, with populism and illiberalism on the rise, cities are leaning out the other way. Their dense, diverse populations understand that they need to work together, that a return to the past is not in their interest. When Fidesz promises a return to the values of old, a young, green politician opposition candidate becomes the mayor of Budapest. So incensed was the Turkish Prime Minister Recep, Recep Tayyip Erdogan that the AKP did not win the Istanbul mayoral election, that he called for a recall. Well, we all know how that ended. The opposition mayor won. The values of liberal democracy, of pluralism, of freedom of opinion and association, these values, long the values of the transatlantic alliance, they live in our urban streets. Cities will build parallel structures for political power until they're heard. The U20 organization of 25 global cities was designed to empower the voices of cities at the G20. The UN has turned to cities to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. And when you talk about resources, the Global Parliament of Mayors has been designed as a platform to actually argue for that, for the power of the purse. Here, Atlanta and Aarhus and Dayton and Milan have created a platform to push back against discretionary power. Will city networks replace NATO, the WTO? No. But as seismographs, they provide valuable intelligence for data and for anticipatory foreign policy and new threat modeling. As a second tier of the transatlantic alliance, cities can play a critical role. Where's the NATO Urban Council? Where is the WTO consultative body on urban impacts of trade disputes? Slowly, too slowly, nation states are beginning to see the light. Wake up, nation states. It's time. Cities are already living in the future that nation states can only imagine. For the transatlantic relationship to remain vital in the future, governments will need the access, the data, the connections to deliver what citizens need today. Physical security, economic security, and their protection of democracy. Our cities have that knowledge. Our national governments are deeply lacking. If we're serious about reviving this transatlantic bond, that's where we're going to have to look. But there's a glimmer of hope, and that's what I'll end on. Just last month, in the U.S. Congress, there was a bipartisan bill introduced for city and state, the City and State Diplomacy Act. It was introduced to create an office of subnational diplomacy, because you know what? The State Department would like to have a part of that action. And right here in Germany, too, we have now, at the heart of the foreign ministry, a new uh, city diplomacy unit. 900 years ago, Cities banded together in the Hansa for urgent self-interest, and they became the bridge that took their world from the Dark Ages to the Renaissance. If we in this room, classically trained to see the freedom of Westphalia as where it's at, at the beginning of real progress, if we could adjust our reference points a couple of generations back and give credence to the power of cities, to the Hansa, and see what is embedded in our cities, connected, networked as they already are, then we might just be able to save the transatlantic relationship from within.
Thank you so much for this passionate plea for urban diplomacy. Greatly appreciate that. Are there questions? Uh, right here, please. My, oh. <laughs> my five times great grandfather was the mayor of Riga, and I was born in Lübeck, the two main cities of the oh, Hanseatic League, and yes. I was fascinated by your uh, reference to the Hanseatic League. And I would ask, could you elaborate a little bit more what a closer look at the uh, Hanseatic League would have to tell the European Union in terms of economy, policy, uh, uh, culture, uh, and right. so on? Right. I think what we had, what was created over, and this is something that I think needs to be underlined, the Hanseatic League and historians fight about this, right? Whether it was functional for 300 years or 500 years, but either way, it was hundreds of years. I mean, that's almost unimaginable in our day and age. But I think this is, and this is what I study now, is what impact does the proximity affect and do shared values and does shared information, right? Human to human contact in the way that the Hanseatic League practiced it through the cogs that could, one cog, eine Kogge, right? Could feed an entire city. And you mentioned Estonia, and that was the case in the Hanseatic League. I mean, that kind of connection, that kind of understanding for essentialism within that network, right? I think is critical for us now because we have an important blind spot. And Francisca mentioned it and others mentioned it. If we don't get closer to the citizen, and if we don't make these things relevant and resonant, then we're doomed. If I hear one more conversation about transatlantic values without anybody telling me what they are and how they resonate in my own life, then why should I care? And if we don't go back and think about how, and this is what I find fantastic about the Hanseatic League, that proximity effect created the kind of stickiness in this network that allowed it for it to go on for hundreds of years. And so if we don't invest in that stickiness with our supporting architecture in the EU, these multilateral platforms that we already have, but not in this paternalistic way that we've traditionally done it, you know, in the Assembly of Regents, sure, you children can come play too. No, no. This is where the power's at, and if we don't pay attention to that, we're setting ourselves up for cataclysmic failure, frankly, because we're going to lose our citizens, and we're going to lose that connection. So if I look at the Hanza, I look at this strong bond that was based on this proximity effect and on these sort of real lived values, and not values, but values driven by interests. It's the 21st century. We have interests too. Cities have interests too. So if we can connect that and we can mirror that, I think then... We're, we'd be moving forward in a productive way. Just time for one more quick question, and I saw a hand over there, please. Uh, if I, oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, no, um, Tim Jones, British Embassy in Berlin. It's a question, perhaps, the other side. It's to say, um, I think I entirely agree with you about the role of subnational authorities in international relations and how it's growing, and Germany is a fascinating place to look at that because of its history um, and, the, and the federal setup. Um, but where I wanted to ask a question was um, one of the, a, a recent study of populism in the UK came out, studied, uh, uh, entitled, The Revenge of the Places That Don't Matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the question, yeah, you know, cities are doing great, but how does that affect the broader dynamic? You know, is, is that actually, in a sense, destabilizing or one of the destabilizing factors in the broader politics? I mean, I think that's the main thing that uh, people who study urban development now, that's where we're looking, right? Is the breaking point between the city and the rural, right? Because in Brexit, the rest of the country, quote unquote, held London hostage. If you look at the American system, because of gerrymandering, because of the way that the you know, electoral college is designed, South Dakota gets two senators. I just read you the economic numbers for New York City. You know, how does that come together? So I think for all of us that think about how we get the balance right uh, in empowering the kind of, and, and I've just told you how many people are going to be moving into cities. How you negotiate that, I think, is one of the challenges for, for the national system, how you listen more effectively. But the thing is, you're going to have allies in the urban environment to push for that. But conversely, they also see that breaking point. So the thing is, again, finding allies on that level, because cities are 
interested in having rich metropolitan regions or regions outside, because if the regions don't prosper, neither do they. So again, I think there you can take some hope from that self-interested dynamic, providing those dialogues actually happen. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Greatly、so、appreciate it. I'll take the clicker.、Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Please sit down. All right, moving.